Bit of a plug for Ryan Holiday there. Correct. Marketing that stoicism. <laughs> hey, um, fuck, man. We've got three cameras on us. We're live. This is JB Cast. Maybe, I'm not sure, maybe 20, 21, hard to say. 22? 20. Um, just a quick one. Jungle Brothers, you know where we're at. 15 Underwood Avenue, Botany, Sydney, New South Wales. Uh, junglebrothers.com if you want to reach out online. All things strength and mobility and fight work. But um, more importantly, we've got big John Marsh in the house today. Uh, before I hand it over to you, I was just thinking of, I wanted to give an, a title to this episode, something along the lines of optimizing your life, uh, improving your recovery, improving the quality of your life, becoming more mindful. Fuck, it was kind of hard for me to sum it up. So I, I thought, Johnny, just as a bit of an intro, you could talk about, man, who you are and what you do. Cool, man. Well, stoked to be here. Um, always happy to visit JB's here in Sydney. So uh, <coughs> I've done a lot of different things. I, I, my, my, myself, I was not really sure where this podcast was going to go. So I'm excited. Um, but yeah, most recently, um, Jim, co-founder and owner in Melbourne at Workshop Jim, um, I guess strength coach movement stuff um down there and <clears throat> before that um personal trainer and and retail store owner before that um what retail store so i had a running store huh. so specialty running um running and triathlon gear and um that was when i was pretty heavy into the endurance stuff and then um before that in engineering so corporate stuff and, and, and working on airplanes and grew up in New Zealand and I've kind of been involved I guess in um, some form of uh, health coaching or exercise coaching some you know one of those domains for for a while off and on you know since pretty much a whole life I guess um, tried out the engineering didn't didn't last there <laughs> what type of engineering was it it was hectic I remember uh, I was in aerospace engineering, so um, had a couple of different gigs in that. Went to w um, actually lived in Maroubra here, studying that, um, which was cool. And then um, went to Newcastle, worked up with the F 18s there for a while, and then um, and then moved to the building industry for a little while. And yeah, then I got done with driving spreadsheets and moved on. Started to help people. How old are you now? Uh, Thirty three. Okay. Yeah. And so you've recently kind of, uh, I guess, pivoted a little bit on, on your role. I mean, you know, you had your gym. You were, I, I'm guessing you were doing a lot of coaching at that time, but you've, you've moved away from the gym thing. You've recently run a bunch of workshops, one being here at the gym where you were talking about teaching us about breath work and breath awareness, a bit of meditation, that kind of thing. What, how did this come about? How did you end up? switching to this direction as a coach yeah it's a good question man so i guess nothing's i guess is kind of clear cut as cut as it looks you know um the meditation stuff uh back when i was in engineering i was going through some little dark patches and um kind of was you know up and down in terms of the mind with a lot of stuff and um my mom introduced me to some meditation and you know, so that was 2008 or so. And so since that, I've had this rocky um, path with um, meditation, um, I guess, awareness or conscious work around breathing um, in some form or another. And it was pretty patchy. I met uh, some pretty important mentors. Cole, who you've met, was one of them. Um, shout out, Cole. Yeah, shout out to Cole. So I guess... But the last maybe five years, it really developed. I started to, it, it, it became more than just a tool to move away from pain and it became its own, um, its own, I don't use the word journey, but its own thing and its own interest or passion or, or to be honest, pivotal part of my life that um, just couldn't be ignored. You know, it was huge and it would be, I'm um, not just a daily time frame, something that, you know, I was interested in or utilizing, but also, um, as soon as I started to do those solo silent retreats and the longer retreats, um, I just, it was changing my life, you know? And so, 
uh, I do work with people in terms of their movement and their training and um, this whole concept of, of stress, of joy, of um, everything that was, um, you know, uh, not beyond their training, but just the, the other side of the coin, the other side of the physical um, coin is always something that interested me. Um, and then it just kind of went from there. Did some, I did a meditation teacher training thing to kind of see what that was like. But um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've done a few, the retreats probably with the first time where it was like, okay, I'm going to like open this up to other people and see what that's like. Um, and so... Which was, yeah, what I experienced. I went on your retreat earlier this year, wasn't it? Yeah. Earlier this year? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, I knew they were powerful from myself and I thought let's implement this with some people and share it and see what happens and incorporate some of the movement as well because um, it can't really be separated, you know, and, and that was awesome. So, um, and then the last 12 months, 18 months, it's just accelerated. Like my passion for this focus on the breath um, and including um, this concept of neuroception and how we're looking at our training and our context for training and um, how this can impact our results and our recovery and our um, states of mind as well. And, um, you know, because in a gym, I would see a lot of people training and, and have this question like, why are some people, you know, training six days and not getting the results and some people training two and, you know, getting great results or how come, you know, I've gone from training six times a week, you know, hours a day to twice a week or whatever and still getting the same results and what's behind that and you know I was starting to use more tools for down regulation and um, you know really being conscious around this idea of intent and in my training and and um, and everything that I could all these tools to try to basically um, make it easier for the physiology to adapt and it becomes it, when I look way back it's a, this concept of adaptability. You know, the triathlon days, um, when I was into the heavy strength work, the, anything that's been a tool to pivot has really just been a tool for adaption. Um, and so the way I look at it, the, the more we can adapt, and that's from a mental um, perspective as well, um, this idea of neuroception, you know, how do we perceive our environment? How does that impact our adaption or adaptability? The more we can embrace that and the more tools we can in use to assist that, um, the better, the easier, you know, the more fun. It, like, it's a win-win. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me, um, like, to bring it, to give it a bit of a, a I guess, a, an overall view for people who are listening, who perhaps terms like downregulation, um, adaptation or adaption, those kinds of things, what do you mean when you're talking about that? Give me a little bit more. You know, what's, what's down regulation here? What's its relevance to an individual at the gym? Yeah, cool, man. Just pivoting the mic a little bit. So... If you dump... I just tried this. If you dump this a little bit and then tilt up, yeah, you so get your beautiful face there on camera. Yeah. First time we're doing this on... How do I pivot that up? There we go. You're an engineer, bro. Yeah, there we go. Figure that shit out. Yeah. All right, so... <clears throat> the nervous system, the autonomic nervous system basically is governing everything. So what we're doing is um, is taking a bit of a stance and going, okay, well, I'm living this life. I'm, you know, I'm going to work. I'm, I'm doing this job and I've got this relationship, these kids, whatever. There's a certain amount of load, physiological load. You could use the word stress if you want. You could use whatever you want, whatever, whatever works for you. Um, when Hans Salye originally coined the term stress, he didn't mean it in the negative connotation that a lot of people think about it now. Um, I think that was back in the 30s. But what he meant was load. What he meant was it was, was almost more... Like a demand. Correct. More like strain, strain on the system. Yeah. To up to a point, we can adapt if we have the right resources, and beyond that point, we don't. We have distress. Um <clears throat> Distress being the, the negative, the downside of it. Yeah, correct. And so he found this um, general ad adaptive syndrome, I think it was. But basically he was finding this this common um, driver behind stomach ulcers, behind um, you know, a lot of the heart disease, behind a lot of the symptoms that he was seeing in a hospital. Um, and, he, and he coined this term stress. He was like, okay. And from that point on, they realized that this environmental stress or um, 
mental, emotional, or physical from any one of these areas could impact our greater physiology. So anyway, we have this we have this given load on the system at all times, and then really what the the only difference here is that my I stepped in through it was after the retreats. Um, which obviously we enter a, a very quiet place physically and mentally. Coming back out of these, I was like, okay, cool. So going into the retreat, I thought I was at a, a um, you know, six out of six out of ten or whatever. Once I got into, it, I realized I was nine out of ten. You know, so we're not able to see where this general load is usually. The physiology, the physical body, will show us, but it lags a little bit. All right, so. This idea of down regulation is okay. How do we use some bridges between the conscious mind? Um, so, being what we're doing, what we choose to do, what we choose to say, what we choose to set up for our environment, and our subconscious mind and our physiology. So, food could be a really good one. We can choose what to eat, um, and it can have an imp Im implication or an impact on the physiology, how we recover. So down regulation is simply a conscious choice to adjust a few parameters to allow the physiology to reduce that load, to, to overcome that stress. So <clears throat> it was evident, you know, after enough of the meditation, enough of these types of things, it was of, of living in this way, you would start to get more insight into when the system was stressed or under a high excitatory load or a high load, and when it wasn't. And I started to notice, okay, well, these certain things help and these don't help. You know, training does this and food does that, or sleep does this and meditation does that, and the breathing became a big part of that. So down regulation is simply, all right, we're going to step in and we're going to use a tool and we're going to use it possibly in an acute sense, like, say, after we train or whatever, or we're going to use it in a um, in a broader sense. So we're gonna we're gonna tinker with our environment a little bit to create an environment that might be a little bit more um, conducive to a, a, a lower stress load. Yep. So in in a way, it's all coming back to stress, but not in the way of oh, I feel stressed because a lot of times, especially today, we don't realize we're feeling it. So basically, totally. to wrap it up, it's just tools. It's tools to use to to bring us down. And then the really cool flip side of that is we get more gains. It's more more adaptable, more recovery, um, even more uh, better motor pattern learning. So it's it's pretty cool across the board. That's an interesting idea. The the thing you mentioned that we don't realize how much of that load we're dealing with until we remove some of it or a bunch of it. I think that <laughs> I remember that when I came on your retreat that I kept falling asleep for the first two days at every opportunity. We'd do like a bit of breath work and I'd be snoring like heavily after a couple of minutes or like between like after lunch and stuff, I remember passing out on the couch and I'm not someone that ever naps. Like I, I'm too busy to nap and it's usually like I got to get busy in the afternoon. So I'm like, I just don't make time for it. But it, you know, you pointed out to me, it's like, yeah, it, it, it was probably the first time in a long time I'd been in a space where I could actually just relax. And so the body was taking advantage of that. Yeah, that's right. And that and that was kind of when we started to see with, I guess, just a bit of context in these retreats there. Um, they're completely unplugged, meaning there's no phones, no computers. And, and this kind of drips into that other um, approach, which is tinkering with the environment to change the load. So what we're doing there really is reducing the inputs um, to the nervous system or to the mind, the conscious mind and subconscious mind, taking the phones and computers away. But So that was one thing we did. They literally confiscated them from yeah. us, took it in a big paper bag at the, on the, when we first got there yep. and yep. didn't give them back until we left. It was yeah, cool. so a bit of panic there for a few moments. Fucking felt really weird, eh? Yeah. Really weird handing in my phone. So we, we take those away and then we start to open up space for the physiology to start to unwind. And when we do that at the beginning, um, it can be uh, different for different people. And for a lot of times, like a lot of people, it can be quite quick as well, but a lot of people definitely need to sleep. And you see that in the workshops and stuff too. Like 
there's a level of fatigue in today's um in just today's in today's world and that sounds cliched but a lot of a lot of people are under sleeping and, and not resting enough and so when your body gets the chance to do that you know we might say oh we're going to do some meditation or walking meditation but half the people need to catch up on some sleep which is all good yeah yep. yeah i remember you gave us quite a bit of freedom around that it's like if you get up and you make it to the morning meditation great if you're just sleeping that's cool too yeah exactly yep. just just rest like whatever needs to be done kind of do it what um so on that front like talking about then this this idea of down regulation and this idea of load on you know our organism or on our physiology what do you see environmentally and also perhaps within someone's you know their own mind their way of being what do you see as the the the, the main loads that people are dealing with yeah man it's a good it's a good question um i'm full of them yeah so <clears throat> you could we can look at it on a few different levels um a big one that I see like a lower level but chronic one is what I call context. And this is basically if we just keep this into like the context or, the, you know, the, the environment of the gym and training um, is this idea of why you're training. So it's literally um, when we have, you know, if we have kind of more fear-based reasons around why we're training or hyper-competitive um, in our training, including every single session, um, that can be sending a different message to the physiology, so a different load. Whereas if we come into a training environment that's more collaborative, you know, a great community, um, like what you guys have here, and, um, you know, they're showing this with different types of music and, um, and different lighting in the environment. But basically that context for why we're training, we're here to, you know, um, be part of a great community to... to um, explore new movement patterns to um, cultivate new ability to move well um, are all quite different to okay I've got to I've got to lose these five kilos because I'm starting to get away from me and I'm, I'm worried about you know what that's going to look like another five years from now so there's a different approach to that there's a different posture um, I think that's a big one that's this that's a lower level underlying stress um, that doesn't serve and then Beyond that, we have, um, you know, food is a really big one. There's a massive, and I'm, I kind of go against a lot of people. A lot of people talk about everyone eating too much crap, but to be honest, what I see a lot of is a scarcity mindset around food, especially for a lot of guys. Um, not eating enough food is a massive one. If we don't have enough resources um, in any given situation, basically, if we don't have enough fuel. Um, the perception shifts a little bit from the body. So, you know, people talk about this idea of hangry, whatever. It's real. <laughs> so, like, it's real. If you're stressed, the blood sugar drops. If your your stress levels rise, cortisol rises, you start to stress out, um, you need food. And so there's this, you know, a lot of fasting, a lot of um, keto, a lot of, you know, yeah. carnivore now. Like, there's whatever you want to do, it's available. But I think um, that's probably another one, another major one. Um, and then the, the third one, I guess, which we tackled and mentioned on the retreats is this idea of inputs. I think people are chronically, um, uh, have chronic inputs, you know, so I'm just meaning like constant phone, constant, um, constant something. And this is where the meditation is so powerful. It's basically taking a stance against that and saying, okay, I've got the courage here to sit alone and I'm going to start to sit with that, with the breath. But that level of that inundation of inputs and information and comparison and Instagram, Facebook, um, not against any of those things, but it's just from a purely from a from a um, input information light perspective, blue light, like the whole thing now has become chronic because it's there twenty four seven twenty four seven in your face. Yeah, yeah, and so you know, I I I embrace it because we need it to be able to reach people and spread messages and, you know, do the work we love. I you embrace social media for those reasons. For sure. Yeah. yeah. And I, you know, I used to be against it and all of that, but I couldn't see it in the, in the similar sort of way. But, um, I'd say that collective input thing is pretty massive. 
when people talk about the busy mind. You know, you noticed it probably. We are, we do the retreat. Yeah, we do a lot I'm of I'm doing it right now. Thinking about shit I got to do this afternoon and, yeah. you know, totally, man. Yeah. So we do, we the you know, you do those retreats really simple. You know, you do, you're do you doing the breath work, the meditation, whatever it is. But it, on the flip side of the coin, we basically let that, um, we've let the sea simmer down. We've let everything simmer because we took all of those inputs away. Yeah. And then what do you know? 48 hours in, everyone's around a dining room table laughing and hugging each other and everyone's a family, you know. It's a, yeah. It's like so, it's Having so some very, easy. Some but very not good conversations. Yeah, like very... Yeah. Connected. Yeah, very connected. Yeah, connection. So connection is, you know, a whole arm of this because as we shift down um, and increase that vagal tone or, or shift a little bit more parasympathetic and, and a little bit more towards our center, um, we are in a position where we can connect. Prior to that, we're on this peripheral level. So like whilst you're thinking about what you got to do this afternoon, it's hard for us to connect authentically yep. because I'm not speaking with Joey. You're not getting all of me. No, I'm getting, yep. I'm getting a bit of work in there or a bit of, a bit of, a bit of low level fear or a bit of anxiety or a bit of joy. It doesn't matter. I'm not scared. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel it, you. it's the, uh, it's, and we're not giving each other our best right like that's 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 what this kind of comes down to doesn't it like in terms of it's almost like this lack of connection amongst individuals or amongst people uh, yeah you're very rarely getting someone completely yeah 100 percent. so that's yeah exactly that's kind of the third level from it you know you do the the work yourself but you connect with yourself with the breath or with nature whatever that might be at the time but then from there we can connect broader, um, you know, and, and go outwards. But yeah, that's the ultimately the reason behind all of it is that connection. Um, but it's not always the first thing that draws people in or is the most attractive at the start, you know. It's true. Some people. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. It's kind of like uh, it's not, you, we, don't, we don't sell the gym on community generally. You don't tell people, oh, you know, come to this gym because you're going to find a community to become a part of and that's going to enrich your life. You tell them more on, hey, you're going to get really strong, you're going to drop some body fat, you're going to get mobile, you're going to like, you know, rehab injuries, all these things. But then after a few months, like all that stuff's happening every day, but it's the community that they actually fall in love with. And it's yeah. like, that. this is what I need. I, I want to be. But that's not the sexy thing at the front that bring, that hooks them. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. You mentioned a moment ago uh, parasympathetic uh, vagal tone, a couple of things like this. Tell me about sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system because I know these, you know, nervous system, e even that, a lot of people don't even know what the central nervous system is. Uh, and I know that these days like sympathetic, parasympathetic as terms get tossed around a lot. I might have been guilty of tossing them around myself at times. I like to think that I'm reasonably accurate with them, but maybe you could just give us a bit of a breakdown on what you're actually referring to there. Yeah, for sure. Like, <clears throat> I mean, I guess that um, the precursor is um, it's not my 100% area of expertise, but the way I like to explain it or the way I like to uh, um, invite people to think about it a little bit is, um, well, there's two things. One, it's not like we're cut and dry Sympathetic, parasympathetic. So there's this there's this flowing, this ebb and flow. Um, and but then the second thing is that, and and we need both, um, absolutely. The second thing is that this vagal tone, and often we talk about this ability to downregulate and this shifting of this para, into this parasympathetic state, which is basically in real simplified terms. Um, our rest and digest, you know, mode, so that our ability to um, restore our um, ability to connect and procreate, sex drive, um, recover from training, um, digest food, digest food, you know, um, you know, store memories, like the whole learn new skills, the whole thing happens in this ability to shift over to a parasympathetic, more parasympathetic state. Um, the third offering there is that, as you've noticed when we do, say, the workshops or when we do these kinds of things, um, 
you know, sometimes people can't and sometimes it doesn't come easily and sometimes it's not a, a thing where they're falling asleep. It's a thing where the mind doesn't stop or the, the whole system has been um, taxed for so long that the ability to downregulate uh, isn't there. And kind of the way I like to think about it or, or would sort of um, invite people to look at it in like a gym setting is, all right, cool. We're going to look at this um, ability to switch states because now we're getting into state awareness and, and shifting states, um, which is really cool. The ability and awareness to do this is something that we develop. So it's a skill. It's like and you watch in, to do it consciously. It's a skill. So you watch the animals, you watch like a dog or something. Um, they, this is how they're living. This is how they're doing it all the time. And what do you know? There's no you know, physical tension. Um, they're generally pretty happy. It's a fairly, fairly well-balanced system. For us, what unfortunately we've got is this ability to keep going, keep creating inputs, that default mode network in the midline of the brain, to keep thinking about the future, keep the whole system going, and literally avoid that other side of the coin, avoid that downregulated state for long enough to the point where we lose that ability to cultivate that tone. And then we start to see the plateaus and we start to see the chronic issues come in. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of how I'd, I guess, offer it up. Um, talking like, uh, like nervous system where, you know, so if we're looking at parasympathetic and sympathetic, tell me if I'm right here. Um, essentially both, they're both, they're both parts of our nervous system, but at any one time, one of them can be more dominant. Yeah. So when we're, so, you know, you mentioned before that the parasympathetic was that kind of rest and digest state which we could consider that yeah like exactly that like a relaxed down-regulated chilled kind of state ideally where you want to be at home in the evenings before you go to bed kicking around after dinner like that's sort of the zone you're, you're meant to be in and then when we're looking at the other side of that that's the fight flight or freeze more so right and so that's kind of i know for myself as a business owner i'm kind of there all day you know because it's like cool get up early start coaching, start being productive, do my shit, work during the day, training. Training is definitely quite high up on that list. Um, so the idea is we're meant to spend a bit of time in each of those zones, but are you kind of saying that these days in our modern world, a lot of us are spending too much time in the in the, uh, the fight, flight, freeze kind of zone? 100%. Man. Sympathetic so, yeah. nervous system? So basically, like up my all my chips are on the table, and I'm a hundred percent all in on down regulation. That's just fucking what everyone needs. Yeah, yeah. I'm like I'm like walking around. <laughs> no one needs up regulation skills. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like we and I talk about up regulation. We do need to be able to do it, and I do it. Like we need to do it to go into a heavy lift or to get stuff done. But it also is coming from subconscious postures too. So ways that we're living subconsciously, how we're sitting, how we're looking at the screens, blinking less, moving the eyes around less, um, focusing on a fixed point, you know, so far from the face. All of these things that we're doing are relaying subconscious messages in that are helping to keep us upregulated longer. Yeah. So the upregulation has become chronic, as is the tension in the physical body is becoming chronic. So... <clears throat> Yeah, like you mentioned before, you know, some of the time, a few percent of the time, we want to be parasympathetic. I'm, I'm the way I um, focus is as much time as possible, as much awareness as possible to cultivate the tools to keep, to basically be shifting over towards parasympathetic. It makes sense because when I hang out with you, I had this thing where I'm like, fuck, speed up, Johnny, walk a bit faster. Come at me, man. I just asked you a question. You know, whatever. I'm like, I'm I'm immediately alerted to the fact that you operate you seem to operate on a on a more considered pace or a slower pace. And and you know, there's kind of like a and I you know, there's like a friction there that I notice, and then I'm like, huh, yeah, it's probably because I'm a little bit jacked up and maybe I shouldn't have drunk all that coffee and maybe I should have slept a little bit more last night. But I'm you know, I think I, I can feel that you cultivate that side of yourself and it's kind of it's apparent in your in your person yeah i mean we're all gonna have different i guess behavioral you know uh patterns or whatever but yeah like we 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 were 
we were raised, I guess, in a way that was introduced this stuff pretty early, um, you know, living on boats and stuff like that. But you grew so up on a boat, yeah. So it's been, it's been, it's probably just been there a long time. So it's probably not so much like I drive down here and then it's something I stop and do some breathing <laughs> before I walk in the door. It's probably just more, um, you know, we're a product of kind how of ingrained we live. in you, yeah, yeah. We're a product of our environment and our context and and our um, what I call allies, which are kind of our practices that we use to to um, perform or to carry out our day to, you know, increase awareness or vitality, how we train, all of that sort of stuff. So we're just kind of a walking around representation of that stuff. I had a guy in here the other day, just joined the gym. Shout out to Zach. He's a, he's a country boy. I can't remember exactly where he's from. But he was saying, um, you know, he's been living in Sydney for a year or two and his, his brothers are here and, and he's working a bunch and that kind of thing. And I think I asked him, I was like, how do you like Sydney? And he said, oh, man, I fucking hate it. And, um, you know, and he has a good time here, but he's like, it's just it's fucking, ex- it's so fast. Like everyone's just working all the time. The traffic's fucked. It, the, the main thing though that he mentioned um, was that no one says hi to him. And he said, like, maybe he's from Dubbo. But he was like, man, where I grew up, y- you walk past someone on the street. If you walk past that person like twice in a, within a couple of weeks, they've become your mate. Like they recognize that. And then you say hi to each other from every day from then on. He said, I can walk, I walk past the same people like every morning here in Sydney and no one's even looked at me, you know. They're too, too busy moving along. And it just kind of, you know, and I always notice that with people that are from the country or perhaps people that have grown up on an island or somewhere a little bit more isolated, um, they tend to have a slower pace and a little bit more time for things. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, and I think it's easy to get caught up in um in that sort of stance against cities or against because it's true yeah people are hustling um it does shift your state a little bit but <clears throat> one one thing that um we can do is start to or i think is start to understand that if we want to we can choose our own context so if we look around and we and we don't choose, we're given this default one as a product of the city, you know, which is to make enough money to survive and keep going basically and hustle. Um, and that's pretty much the one that's dominant in the culture. Um, but as soon as we go, okay, hold on. If that's my, you know, default context from going to uni and, and working in this type of job, whatever, what if I change that and what if I give that a new name and what if I create something of my own? Um, maybe it's, maybe it's um, you know, it could be kind of your, your values or whatever. I call it your context or your journey, but your, um, it could be connection or it could be love or it could be these things which you know make you feel really, really good. And if that dude's, um, what's his name, Zach? Zach. Yeah, if Zach's like, okay, you know, screw this. I know I'm in Sydney, but from, from tomorrow my context, my whole reason or the whole power behind my journey while I'm here is to connect with people through my work, through everything I do because I know that makes me feel good because when I think back to where I used to live, I used to have that connection. I used to feel really awesome. If he turns around and makes a stand for that and then he starts to cultivate his own environment, people around him, ways of living and you know, ways of... Um, shaping his maybe his home or his gym or whatever it is um, and then his tools day to day to support that he can still create and fulfill that context so he can still be that person and still enjoy that and I think this is this concept of mirroring which is a subconscious reflection of each other's behavioral patterns it's really common and it's needed on an evolutionary um, basis it's like you and I staying here we're already mirroring posture uh, we've mirrored T-shirts. I don't know if that was the same. But, <laughs> but basically, it's a really normal thing. One person will pick up. You see it in running as well. People pick up each other's gait, cadence, stuff like that. Um, but mirroring on behavioral patterns is something which can, you know, like in Melbourne, everyone wears black. It's like in, in <laughs> when I was down there, black for four years. Yeah, right. You come up here, white. <laughs> or <laughs> colors. It's like it's it's just what we do as a culture. But if we become conscious around that shift and have these reminders or these tools in place to support that, it's like, you know what? 
I'm living in Sydney, but screw that. Like I'm 100%. I'm going to embrace Sydney for what it's got to offer and I'm going to connect with people and I'm going to be that person. You know what I mean? It's hard and it, and it needs that almost sometimes that pain point to make that shift. Uh, but I think we can do it. And um, I think then it changes it a little bit for sure. Yeah, so it's taking it slightly different. Like it's not just jumping onto that negative kind of 100%. attachment to arts. Oh, you know, it's this, it's that. Yeah. Because you could, you could, you could just, you could cultivate the shit out of that and just be super negative on your whole Can't, situation, yeah. right? Yeah, you can, you can just accept the, the, the context that's given to you, um, which for a lot of people isn't going to serve them in terms of a, in terms of a, um, a mindset. Or you can say, you know what, I'm going to create a new culture, and, um, and you know, he comes in, he goes, hey Joey, I, I heard you talking about how I like to connect with people. I know you like to connect with people. I want to hang out with you once a month, you know, invite you into his environment yep. at a closer level. Maybe and then cook a dinner for me. Correct. And the whole lunch. Exactly. And then you've got a culture that shifted. Right. And I mean, that's what's so cool about coming here is because when you have gyms or you have small businesses or people leading in this uh, in the community and there's a level of awareness there around things like connection and people walk in and you're looking them in the eye and you're saying, how are you going, Joey? Like, how was your day? Like, awesome, you made it in. Like, you got a connection that's not being offered up um, probably anywhere else during the day. And that can be real powerful for what I mentioned before on this perception and evaluation of the environment or the neuroception. Yep. So if I walk into the gym and it's just like 100% um, high-intensity circuits and, and um, techno playing or whatever... Uh, and no one says my name and I go and I find my place and, and follow a computer screen or whatever. Um, or w- you know, there can be a, an environment or a perception, a shift in perception about what I'm, what I'm getting myself into, a subconscious perception. So it's not even, we don't even realize it, but when we've got real connection with the people that we're training with or our practitioners, um, it's telling my subconscious mind, hey, John, like when you come into Jungle Brothers, you're welcome here. You're in a really cool environment. Yeah, we're going to get strong and, and mobile, but you're also among friends. It's a safe place to come and to hang out. Uh, if you want to come hang an open gym, do that as well. But straight away, I'm like, okay, cool. Like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that drive. I'm going to come over there because, and that could be even a subconscious shift. Um, so even things like that, but yeah, you know, he couldn't, and we all can do this um, and this is a big part of this breath attention work and a big part of the whole thing behind us is to is to when we cultivate that awareness in ourselves like he's going man I really miss this is then the next step okay cool let's create that shift you know let's let's create the place where we all want to be and connect you know talk to me about the uh, the nuts and bolts of the breath awareness what do you what do you mean by that yeah it's a good question so <clears throat> To me, the breath, um, anything to do with breath attention came from the endurance sport. So I was doing Ironman triathlons and um, there was this idea, don't don't suck air, don't show that you're sucking air. And it was basically, mm-hmm. once you're switching to a mouth breathing hyperventilation or once you're breathing in a taxed way, it was a sign of weakness. So you, you didn't want to... Your, to, your, to the people you're competing against? Yeah, yeah, or even training just with mates, you know. Right. It's like, oh, they're sucking air, they're done, you yeah. know. It's like, you, yeah, you don't want to be that person. You want to be composed. So that was the beginning, you know, 10 years ago maybe. But then it came, so that's in the movement side of it. That's where it started, right? It's this idea that how we're breathing is sending a message to the physiology as well of the environment that we're in. Uh-huh. Next step, we have obviously the like seated practices and stuff like that. And you, now you're seeing a lot of like this holotropic breath work and um, you know, more hyperventilation techniques and things like that. Um, what I'm more passionate around is this concept of what's called, what I call the subtle breath. So it's really cultivating the skill to achieve that more down-regulated state or that vagal tone, whether that's in a specific seated practice, and usually that would be slower, um, more hypoventilation work, or hypo as in the opposite of hyperventilation. Yeah. So, so hypo is like less less breaths. Correct. Correct. Yep. So um so whether it's in a seated practice, like I say, after we train, we're gonna down regulate a little bit, or whether it's in the movement itself to change the neuroception or the perception of the environment of what we're doing to make it more abundant. And so 
that came back from that training thing. So if I'm doing the Ironman or I'm doing a workout and I'm the guy sucking air with pain all over my face and a lot of tension through the upper, you know, the shoulders, the neck, the jaw, um, and I'm yelling and hollering and all of this, I've created a different perception. It's like posture. It's a different posture. You know how they're showing like people sit back and if you open your arms up, your testosterone levels go out. It's like, it's the same Alpha thing. posture. Yeah. You have different postures and we can use these as conscious tools. Breathing is one of them and a super powerful one. Um, so when we train, when I, when I train or if I'm teaching someone around movement, especially if they're under a higher physiological load, my main thing is, okay, cool. Well, the movement we want to be abundant. We want it to make you feel better today, next week, next year, next decade. And we're going to use some breath attention to um, most likely slow it down a little bit or to adjust your rest periods a little bit. But definitely, um, it might, most of the time today is to slow it down. But basically to create that less stressed physiology in, within that session so that we um, help to keep that load, that total load under wraps um, and it comes back to that stress. So what you're getting at is if you can have these, you know, in a practical sense, if you can have these kind of intervals of breath attention or breath awareness where you're sitting down, putting some time into it, you are, you're essentially bringing that, that, that stress level down or that load down and the, the cumulative total of that is that looking at a day or a week or a month, you've just lowered the amount of stress on your body. Yeah, so, okay, that's, your, that's like, like, say, a daily practice type thing. Yeah, so I call that like an ally. That would be breath as a, an ally in a seated practice. So, okay, you're going to sit and we'll do, here, here's, some, here's one to start with, right? You're going to you know, do this breath work practice or whatever. Yes, that's going to downregulate the physiology and it might not be the first time you do it. It might take you a little bit of practice or whatever. In an acute sense, yes, that's going to help. And the cumulative impact of that is going to help because you're also going to get better at it too. Then we've got right here and now. So I'm standing with you now. I can come to the breathing. I can do allow what I call a, you know, um, a subtle breath through the lower two-thirds of the trunk. Nasal breathing. I can just do three breaths. And then I can relax the eyes a little bit, let the lids close, shift the eyes left and right, cultivate some saliva, relax the shoulders, straight away downregulate the whole physiology. So it's both. It's breath attention in action. Mm -hmm. And then it's breath attention once we've like redlined, we're going to, okay. And that's the like the, the one after the training or whatever that we do in the workshops. That's like, all right, you go hard, you breathe fast, well, let's go slow. That's the, that's the, um, but then it's the, the, you know, the attention that that also cultivates. It's like when you do the, the seated practice enough, you start to go, oh, well, it feels, I really like how I feel after this. And then you're halfway through your day and before a stressful meeting, you're like, whoa, okay, <laughs> this is different. Oh, I'm going to go back to how, what I learned from this morning. And then that's where we start to get this idea of breath attention ongoing. And you could think of it like a game, you know, but it's really this lens or this vocabulary and awareness around breathing, tension, perception of environment, mental, mental emotional states, mm -hmm. and excitation, you know. That's, a, that's an interesting one, like, because it does, having that practice or having some exposure to it, I think even having exposure to one of your workshops is almost in a way enough to for you to have that little that I don't know it's that awareness to check in every now and again which I notice for myself I've not been practicing as such but on a daily basis I'm made aware of what my breath's doing and sometimes it's when I'm not doing it well like if I'm driving in a you know I'm rushing to work that kind of thing and I'm you know I'm mouth breathing or I'm breathing at a, you know I'm breathing fast and then I'm like, oh, shit, I'm breathing fast. I need to just chill that out, start breathing through the nose, lower down the, the pace a little bit. Or sometimes it just pops into my mind and it might be mid-conversation or something like that. Whereas 
prior to having any thoughts or any any, any exposure to this work, I never would have I never would have stopped to ever think about those things. Yeah, hundred percent. So like, on an extreme end, we've got, and you could look at if you like sport, you can look at athletics. You know, you can look at Usain Bolt when he's crossing the finish line with a smile on his face. That's all neuroception. Like, how do you think his physiology feels when he's smiling? You know, or Rich Froning, who his breathing's completely relaxed for those people, you know, following CrossFit and stuff. I remember watching. He's a good breather? Oh, yeah. And also just composed. Right. You'd watch him go at the start of those workouts when he'd be way behind. And he's like stepping over the bar, walking forward, picking up the next bar. People are blasting in front of him, but he's just super chilled, focused, composed. So the, the physiology is getting a completely different message. Mm-hmm. Then at the other end, we have usually a lot of um, us who get into movement or some form of practice later in life. And it's like we've got a lot of, t- lot of lost time. So we get into the gym and go 110% yeah. to try to catch up. But the physiology, it, it, we can't trick it that quickly. So it's a shift to the long game because as soon as we go into that hyper adrenaline hyper cortisol state to try to catch up we then are shooting ourselves in the foot because then the whole recovery process is switched the whole neuroception the whole perception of the environment that we're in is shifted because we're in a stress state yeah it's like i'm chasing you you know and it's all out on the rowing machine or whatever yeah so it's a it's it's a um it comes back to adaptability we want to be adaptable because then we can, if we want to learn a new movement, we want to, you know, get stronger, whatever it is, or just be a um, little bit more connected to people around us, all of this, we want to have adaptability in that parasympathetic, sympathetic shift. And so um, the breathing is the breathing is cool because it's a, it's a dashboard light. Like you mentioned, oh, I noticed I'm breathing fast. Yeah. And it's a conscious, it's a tool. It's a stop at the garage with your car and like tweak some stuff. Yeah. So it's both. Um, Like a diagnostic. It's a diagnostic. It's an assessment too as a practitioner. It's a diagnostic as self. And it's a, um, it's a, it's a tune up as well. Yeah. It's a practice. It's really, really cool. So um, when we do like one of the programs we run, it's basically one of the games is a three breath check in. You try to accumulate 20 reps across the day. So we teach people how to cultivate the habit. You know, every time you pick up that drink bottle, that's three breaths for you or whatever, or whenever you check your phone or whatever. But there's a game there. So what we're trying to do is to bring the habit. It's just a habit like anything else, you know, walking, whatever it is. It's breath attention. It's just like, okay, cool. I'm starting to learn this habit. It's, you know, and at the beginning, you forget all the time, and then slowly, slowly, surely, it starts to um, come up. Tell me, um, bringing it into like a uh, a really, I guess, a real relevant sort of uh, place for people who are listening and like, oh, okay, like starting to get a bit of a grasp of it, and and realizing that perhaps they could do with a little bit of help around this or a little bit of work around it themselves. What what do you identify working with humans? Uh, you know, let's say like the top three, the top three fuck ups people have in this realm, the top three places where they're either ignoring something or going wrong or allowing something to override. Yeah, cool. Like in the, in the training type stuff? Or no, how? in life. Oh man, that's a big question. <laughs> yeah. But like the, the, yeah, the look, you know, the main ones. Okay. I Cause can for an, if for example, I know for me, one of my main ones yeah. is perhaps not enough sleep. Okay. That's huge. I just know not enough. Right? But yeah, give me your thoughts. Okay. One is we don't know when our time is up. Yeah. Like could be today, whatever. But don't say that. But what we do know is that we have our whole life. However long that is. So let's let's move, let's do our training, let's do our food, let's do our work with that patience. Yeah, like you've got, you start up at the gym or you're seasoned, you know, seasoned pro or whatever, you've got your whole life ahead of you. So each session 
it changes a little bit, you know. You you come in and you you talk to the coach, whatever it is, you learn about the session, you may talk about how it, how it wants to feel, you carry out the session, and it's for the session itself, it's for the practice itself, but it's also for next year, it's for 10 years down the line. And and that shift in um, posture, that long game shift, to me, um, is ironic because that brings the results. So that's that's because of that patience. We we rush less, we practice more, we watch more, hmm. we feel more, um, we notice more, we learn more, and because there's a little bit of franticness taken out, um, we get results more quickly. So. <clears throat> It's like training, you know. I, I like to think of it like training, like a pro or whatever. They, when they, it's a different, it's a different, um, there's a different process going on, and that's just a, a time frame confusion. Um, so that's what I call long game. That's the, b the big one, I think. And when we look long game, it's like, okay. You talked about sleep. I don't sleep enough. Well, why not? Because I got too much to do. Well, w what happens in ten years if we don't sleep enough? <laughs> it's like straight away that one thing shifts everything why do i stop to do breath attention work why do i have a breath practice why do i down regulate i could be doing more work i could be getting more stuff done i could train more i've only got three minutes well you know this can go one of two ways <laughs> we can keep going your way for 10 years how's that feeling you know and it's not this isn't shifting any way as bad it's just going okay or do you like where that's headed? Yeah or, yeah, or or if you like the feeling of sleep or how you feel when you sleep well, let's extrapolate that over 10 years. Yeah. What's that going to do to your bottom line? What's that going to do to your productivity? So it's it's just a re it's just a zoom out on the time frame. That'd be number one, I think. And that changes, you know, food choices because all of a sudden you're like, okay, cool. You're looking at whatever you starting to buy for the week or for a snack. And <clears throat> once it's long game, it's like, okay, yeah, this might, you know. If I've got my eye on the long game, am I really going to go for like, you know, I don't know what, like a Coke Zero or something? Like it's, 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 yeah, it's giving me a short term thing, but is it, is it really in my long game strategy, you know? And you might decide it is if that's what you think, but sure. it's also going to play a role in your food choices, relationships. It's a really cool one to kind of zoom out. Um, and I got that really from uh, just watching my dad. He's 70, you know. And I've seen your dad on Instagram. He's a beast. Yeah, he's a beast. And I talk to him a lot. I'm like, how's it feel to be... He you looks... Know? You know that kind of... There's that guy in the States. I think he's an anti-aging doctor. Yeah. And he's like... And they, he always gets shown on like bodybuilder memes where it's like, you know, making you feel bad about not lifting weights all the time. Yeah, yeah. And then it's like this 70-something-year-old dude with like gray hair, similar to your dad, like bald on top. Yeah. Gray hair around the sides. Yeah, and then yeah. his body's just fucking jacked. <laughs> Yeah, your dad looks a little bit more natural than that. Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. He's, reminds me of that guy. He's pretty fit, but he. So he, I asked him once. I'm like, you know, when you look in the mirror, what does it feel like? Because he's he was I think 65 at the time. So he's like, I feel like I'm 15, or I, I think he said I feel like I'm your age. And what I realized is, you know, <clears throat> we just it, nothing really changes. You just keep going, and when you start to have that patience. Um, then it changes it changes everything it changes each day and so i like talking to you know people of that generation above or hang out you know i like to learn from you know people that are older and that'd be number one number two um how do I mean do i need three if you got three I definitely got two um I'm trying to think of the next one i'd say uh, okay next one number two is um we talk, let's use number two of, um, yeah, let's use number two of environment. So environment, your, your reality, your, your people around you, your habits, your actions that help to shape your day-to-day -day experience of reality. You know, we were talking about this earlier. Um, it's super, super powerful. And this particularly is the people around you. And for me, when I, I just moved up to Newcastle, first thing I do is like, go hang out with people who support my context, you know, people who are um, supportive and, and possibly even willing to push me or um, are aligned with where I want to go, what I feel is important in life. And I think 
a lot of people might will be trying to get somewhere in a certain part of their life or their training or their work and they're so inundated with social media or whatever that they kind of feel like they've they've got they got people around them but they also might feel a little bit alone and a little bit stressed and um what i'd suggest is that most people out there who have been where you are and who are further ahead than you maybe it's could be getting you know on your health and fitness stuff it could be business whatever they generally are really accommodating open and willing to help um if you show up and you contribute and, and that might just be company who knows but i think creating an environment around you consciously with people who serve that your context and where you're going is number two people just aren't doing it because they're so surrounded on the phones and so it feels like there's people always but it's not the connection that you need to really to go next level yeah um, and flip side if the people in the environment aren't serving you and they're toxic and you really are clear on your context whatever that is and where you want to be going um fuck them off yeah you you have and it's from a place of love and it's like all right this is not working you know interesting actually um you follow strength sensei he's passed don't rest he? in peace yeah yeah Intr- strange thing his instagram is more active than ever is it obviously he's the, the company is still posting a lot yeah but they both said you know and it's all like his we're talking about charles poliquin but his uh charles you know charles would always say and then they put some post but there's the five by five rule which I'd never heard of, but it's very similar to what you're saying, um, that you're kind of the product of like your top five habits. You're the product of the top five foods you eat or the food, the five foods you eat the most and also the five people you spend the most amount of time with. I kind of like that. I was like, fuck, yeah, it's kind of cool. It's yeah. quite a look at it. Yeah. The, la- the last one, I reckon, and this was a game changer for me, is, um, is to define your own like you know like we've been calling it context here but like define your own um journey define what it is that you really enjoy without anyone else around you so like for example zach like i'm just putting this out there but like for me connection is is a big part is really really important um this idea of connection, of love, of um, contribution, community, when those things come together, I feel way happier. Sounds like Zach might too. So as soon as we define that for ourselves, everything else changes too because those top five people in your environment, who do you think you're going to search out? Do you know what I mean? There's other people who are expressing that context as well. Yep. Those, those, the breath practices or the training practices or everything else on the day-to-day level, it's pretty easy to start to create your, your morning routine, if you want to call it that, whatever you're doing, because, well, is it supporting my context? Is it sub- leading where I want to go? Um, I was speaking with, a, with someone recently and they were talking about this woman recently defined her context. Like, yeah, I'm, it's, it, for me, it's this love and connection is... It's what really lights me up with her family, with her friends. Um, when I wake up, I want to make a good breakfast that supports me, nourishes me. I can go out into my work. My husband, he just has a um, like a isogenics or something, like a, just a quick shake and he's out the door and then he watches TV and I, I don't know what to do. Well, it's like, well, if his context 100% is to go and make money or he might be losing his job or it's just a completely different um reason then why would he stop to 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 make a nourishing breakfast of course it's going to fall away and he's going to go for whatever's faster because on the surface if you don't really dig down it looks like it would support his context better to get out the door quicker and get to work yeah so it's an incompatible context there so it's gonna it's a hard one there's conflict um but once you define that and for some people it's different to other people but and not really care what anyone thinks and you define it for you, um, I think that changes everything. It changes your training. It changes your food. It changes the people who you seek out, the people around you. Your context, as you put it, is kind of like how your, like your perception of, of things, right? Like what, you, what kind of lens you're looking at life through? Kind of, man. It's like I kind of describe it as a blend between um, if you had to bundle up how you want to feel, um, 
kind of what you want to do, um, the journey you're on, all of these things into one. When you take away your daily hustle and grind, what is that? What does that look like? You know, what when you settle it all down, what really feels nice for you? Yep. You know, most of us as a human, it comes down to this love and connection at some level generally, but it not all everyone. Boils down to that. Yeah, not everyone um, has that at the beginning or, or ever, but yeah, <clears throat> when you take away everything else, then we bring back in the other stuff that, you know, whatever you're doing. And then is there alignment in that, you know, with your work and with everything else? So it kind of serves as a compass um, without, I guess, being like a purpose or whatever. I like that. It's a good thing to consider, which I, I, I imagine many don't. I, yeah, I think we, I think none of us do. Um, what we do consider is what the how to do next once we go for 10 years and the context that we've been gifted um, runs contrary to what ours is mm-hmm. because then you get that dissonance and it's like waking up, like, what am I doing? Like, I really don't like this job, but I don't know what to do. Yeah. Like, or, or, or partner or whatever. It's like this, fr- this kind of like frustration because all of a sudden you're like, you realize that there's a mismatch going on, um, which is cool too. It provides that tension, you know. Tell me, uh, what are you keeping it on the practical tip for the people? What do you, can you tell us maybe a really simple way for people to start to cultivate some breath awareness? Maybe a daily practice or an easy way to kind of delve into that realm? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, I'm really big on you creating your own practice or habit. I think if you go to um, classes and stuff like that, it can be great as an introduction. Um, but ultimately, it's it's your own thing. So what I would do there is, w- as um, we know with habits, we, we like to have a cue and a practice and a reward. So I'd like to, I, I would suggest just going, okay, if I want to explore this, what I know is I'm going to need to do it for 30 days or, or 60 to seven days, really. But 30 days maybe to see if it has an impact. So I'm going to run this as an experiment. And I'm just going to go, all right, for 30 days, every time I, you know, every time I go to the bathroom or every time I pick up my phone or whatever, just you create that cue. I'm just going to do, um, you know, I might just do, Um, some simple breath attention to notice what I feel, notice the breath for eight breaths, something like that. Um, And run that. And then in in parallel with that, spend five minutes a day sitting or lying or or being in stillness with the breath. And um, that's it. You could break those five minutes up however you want. But that's pretty minimal um, and it's pretty pretty obtainable for most people and the biggest thing there is that we start to is we start to um, take action and create that little bit of space for ourselves to cultivate something not that we're sitting for 45 minutes in an uncomfortable position you know it's not about it's thinking not, about we can't wait for the 45 minutes to be up yeah it's not about like sore knees and getting through the grind it's about okay Let's look long game, like we said. Let's look 10 years. What do I want to do? Well, I want to start to cultivate attention and notice what I feel, notice what I see, or what I, what I notice with the breathing and maybe my, my attention or my body or my emotions. Okay, let's do that throughout the day a little bit. Here's my cue for that. Might be a, a timer on your phone or whatever. And um, here's my morning or my, my practice of five minutes a day. And then from there, we've got something that can grow. The biggest thing is I, oh, I don't have time. I don't have, I, I, you know, I go straight from wake up, gym, work, whatever. I don't have time for um, I don't, one minute. It's like, well, you can probably cultivate <laughs> a little bit more than one minute. Yep. So yeah. Yeah, it, it's kind of, it's funny because you don't find time for it often. But when you put it in that sense, you're like, you can always, like, it's fucking five minutes, dude. It's five minutes and it's also you're going to have to um, take a stand because no one else is going to give you that time. Yeah. So like if I'm with you and I drive down or whatever, and it's like if I need it, I'm going to have to say, Joe, just give me five. I'm going to go just sit, chill for a second. Yeah. And you don't have to make a thing about it, but no one else is going to 
go, hey, okay, do you want to go sit over there and do your thing? Yeah, <laughs> it's on your shoulders. Yeah, so this is coming back to being, um, you know, to standing into your own, your own sort of um, context or whatever, and doing your what's what you believe in, trying it out on for yourself. Man, um, we're going to wrap it up there. We've just done just over an hour. I, I, before I get you to plug where people can get onto your daily blog and where they can find out more about the workshops you're running and stuff, any any final message or anything that you you know you want to have uh, expounded here on the podcast? Um, no, I don't think... Uh, the biggest thing I think would be to just, if you think that you might have a little tension or you want to improve your training or you want to, you know, dive into the breathing stuff, whatever, the biggest thing would be that it's like a chicken and egg. Just try. Just try it. Run an experiment. I'm a I'm scientist trained, you know, engineering. For me, it's 100%. Check the method out. Implement the method. Check it out. If you get a result, keep going. That's how I started, you know, 10 years later, the result was positive in the first sample, you know, the first test. So you keep going. Yeah. You know, it's not, it's not woo-woo, it's just like, try it. But try the full experiment. Try it for a month or two months or whatever. And then it's kind of like a chicken and egg thing. Then you can start to notice it, then it can cultivate and you can, you know, go from there. Yeah. Right on, bro. Um, that's it. Where can people find you, man? Where can they sign up for your blog, etc.? Yeah, so I just write a daily blog around um, this um, idea of the breath, around this idea of movement and around connection and kind of all things. But that's on uh, my website, um, johntmarsh.com. And that comes out each morning. Then just, that's pretty much it. Instagram, but I'm not, I'm not a leader in that space. <laughs> Not big on the Insta? Oh, no, I'm on it, but just, yeah, pro- yeah. Go to the website. Go to the website and you can find everything there. Or um, Instagram is at, uh, at John T. Marsh. John T. Marsh. The same. Yep. Um, workshops and stuff. People can find information for that on the website. Yeah, um, on the website. I've got a couple more workshops coming up soon, one in Sydney soon. Um, but yeah, it's all, uh, yeah, it's on the website. Um, but if you subscribe to the blog, you'll be first in to know about that. Um, we got that online program that's up with Cole as well. So you'll be first up to see all that stuff. Sick. Yeah. Man, thank you for uh, coming down and featuring on our podcast today. Oh, anytime, man. Love it. Love coming here. Legend. Thanks, brother. Cheers, bro. Thanks, Big John. Uh, we just wrapped up there. Junglebrothers.com, if you want to reach out, uh, you can get us at 15 Underwood Ave in Botany if you want to come and get strong, mobile, skillful, learn to fight, learn to lift, all that stuff. Um, check us out on YouTube as well. And uh, if you do like the podcast, you should definitely have a list of the other episodes. And if you know someone that would get some value out of it, we'd love you to share it with them. Um, the more you can help us spread the word, the more we can keep giving it to you guys. Thanks, fam. Catch you next time.